Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and welcome to a new series called Parallel Programming. So in this series, we're gonna look at a number of different ways that we can write parallel programs, mainly using C++. We're gonna look at things like C++ 11 threads, um, P threads, stuff like MPI, and then pragma-based programming using things like OpenMP, as well as, you know, maybe some GP-related concepts with CUDA and um, OpenACC. So let's go ahead and get started. And, you know, we're gonna start this series by doing, you know, an example using C++ 11 threads. So, you know, a very easy way to get up and running with parallel programming. So we'll just call this example threads.cpp. And we'll just say that this program prints from multiple threads using C++ 11. And it's gonna be by myself, Nick, from coffee before arch, right? So to get started with this, we need to go ahead and include a couple of headers. So one of the headers we need is something to print with. So we'll go ahead and include IO stream. And we'll also need to include um, thread, right? So that's a new header for C++ 11. So then we'll also need a main function, right? So the entry point to our program. And we're going to need basically you know, some entry point for our threads that we're going to spawn. So we're going to create some threads and those threads have to begin execution at some place. Now they can begin execution basically at a function or it could be something like a Lambda, right? So an anonymous function. So in this case, we'll just be using a normal function. So we'll just you know, have a function, we'll call it print func. Um, and then it will take something maybe like an ID, right? So each thread will say print out a unique ID. So then inside of our, um, our function here, we'll go ahead and just use std cout, and we'll say printing from thread, and then the ID, and then we'll go ahead and put a new line character, right? And single quotes because the new line character is just one character. And let's go ahead and close out of that. So this will just be a function that each thread will begin execution in. And then down here in our main function, we actually can create some threads. So let's create, you know, we can create something like four threads that all call the print function, right? So they're gonna basically create threads and they're all gonna print this function. Now it's important to know that with these C++11 threads, these are all within the same process, right? So later on, we'll talk about the difference between, you know, types of parallelism um, where all your threads are say in the same process versus when they're in different processes, right? Because there's different implications there in terms of, you know, how we can pass values between threads. In this case, right, I could pass a pointer to my print function if I wanted to, and I could dereference that pointer, something that's not true with, you know, message passing based systems, you know, such as with MPI, where I may not be able to do something like that, like passing a pointer. So in this case, let's go ahead and create four threads. We can do it very simply by just using std thread, and I give the thread a name, something like T1 or T0. And then I say, I want this, uh, basically the entry point for this thread to be my print function, right? So I can just give it the name, right? That's basically a pointer to that function. And then basically my inputs, right? So in this case, uh, my input is, I just have a single integer, so I'll just pass in zero there, right? And that's all I need to do to spawn a thread. So let's go ahead and spawn a couple more. So we'll spawn four of these, so T1, T2, T3, right? And we'll pass in one, two, and three here, right? So one thing that's important to do is we need basically to, you know, if we want to wait for, say, these threads to finish before our main function finishes, we'll go ahead and join them up later on. So in order to join these threads or basically wait for them to complete, you know, somewhere later in the programs, we can, you know, wait for the threads to finish. And what we can do here is basically say, you know, t0.join, right? And we can do the same thing for all the other threads. So when we're saying join, we're basically saying, I want to wait here until, you know, t0 finishes, then until t1, t2, and t3 finishes. And that's all we really need in our program. So down here, we can just go ahead and do return zero. And that's kind of a minimal example. Um, so let's go ahead and run Clang format, make sure everything's formatted. And here we can say, um, you know, you know, this function is the entry point for our threads. Now there, there is a subtle problem here that we'll get into in just a second, but let's go ahead and just compile this and run this. So to compile it, I could just use a compiler like G++ and uh, I can just compile it with threads and then dash O threads. And depending on your compiler, you may need to specify, you know, standard equals C++ 11 or something like that. If it's not already say default, depending on the version of your compiler. 
Now, one thing you might notice when you try to compile this is, you know, the compiler might yell at me. It might say that it can't find something like pthread create. So basically what's happening here is that, you know, on this system, the C++ threads is implemented using pthreads. So if I want to go ahead and use it, I need to link against uh, lib pthread. So I can do that on Linux by just doing dash L pthread, you know, during my compilation to go ahead and link against that uh, shared library. And then you see I have no problems there. And if I do LDD um, on threads, you can see it's now linked against lib pthread, right? Okay, so what happens when we go ahead and run this, right? So we can go ahead and run threads. So we see that it prints from different threads in different orders. It doesn't, or it prints from each thread in kind of a random order, right? But we see that there's some problems here. It doesn't always print everyone on a new line. Sometimes these prints get interleaved, right? So a very common mistake, you know, that you know, people make when reading documentation early on uh, is this idea of what is thread safe and what does thread safe mean? So when you're looking up, you know, is something like, um, is something like printing from C out thread safe? You know, your imp uh, interpretation of that might be, okay, well, if I go ahead and try to print a string from, uh, from C out, right? Or print a string using C out, you know, it'll print my string, right? And then somebody else can go ahead and print their string. But, you know, in this case, that's not the guarantee that's actually giving you. What it's guaranteeing is that multiple threads can access this C out stream object and it just won't crash the program. It doesn't say anything about, you know, the interleavings of prints here. So we're going to need some way to make sure that only one thread is, say, printing at any given moment. So, you know, how do we do that? Well, we generally do it with something called a mutex, uh, which is a kind of lock, essential mutual exclusion. Basically, we can only have one thread get it, grab the lock, and only one thread holds the lock at any given moment. So we can go ahead and include mutex as well. And then over here, I can go ahead and have a std mutex, and you know we can call it, say, my mutex. And we're just making it at global scope here that way that, you know, every single thread calling this function, you know, knows about this one lock. So we can say our lock at global scope. So now how do we make sure that um, each thread doesn't say, um, uh, so how do we make sure that each thread doesn't uh, go ahead and try to print out of C out at the same time? Well, we make what's known as a critical section, basically a region where, you know, you know, everyone funnels into and only one person can get in at any given moment. So to do that, we can just do my mutex dot lock, right? So this basically locks, uh, this locks the mutex and makes sure that whoever grabs the lock can proceed, but everyone else is basically waiting at that lock. And, you know, it, you know, whoever gets the lock next, right, that's dependent on um, uh, implementation. A lot of times it's done using what's known as this ticket-based system or counter-based system where basically, you know, if you're the first person to go up to the lock, right, it's already taken, you basically grab a ticket and, you know, when whoever has the lock is ready to unlock it, it just passes it on to the next person and so on. There's other schemes where, you know, all the threads just pull at a particular lock. So everyone just retries and tries to lock it at uh, another point in time. So that's something that's implementation dependent. Now we need to make sure here that uh, we need to unlock the mutex at the very end. Otherwise, we could just have threads that are just stalled waiting at this my mutex, right? So we can give an example of that here by recompiling my application. So now you can see I can call threads and you see that the program stalls, right? It's never going to complete. Why is it never going to complete? Well, all of my threads, right? One of them gets in, it prints and returns from that function. But all the other threads are still waiting at that mutex, right? And so they, none of them can proceed forward. So I need to make sure that I go ahead and do an unlock here, right? Of my, you know, after I'm done. So I can do my mutex dot unlock. So when I do this, right, this basically frees the lock so that the next person waiting can go ahead and grab the lock and continue. So if I go ahead and recompile this, and run it again. Now you see that, you know, it may print in different orders, but I don't get this interleaved printing anymore, right? And that's because I only have one thread ever getting, grabbing the lock at a given moment, because only one thread grabs the lock, only one thread is using the C out stream object at a time. So this can be kind of messy though, right? Because as we just saw, it can be pretty easy to forget to unlock something. We, have to, we also have to consider what happens if we, uh, um, you know, maybe what if an exception happens, right? What if an exception happens in a thread and maybe, you know, when that exception happens, 
you know, we don't actually, you know, trigger the unlock, right? We could have just caused a deadlock inside of our code. Um, so one way that we can avoid this is by using something that's a bit more modern, and it follows this design pattern called RAII, which is resource acquisition is initialization. Key idea is that, um, you know, when we create an object or we construct an object, we do things like allocations or grabbing locks. And then when the destructor for that object is called, right, it goes ahead and does things like free dynamic allocation or freeze a lock. And, you know, for this specific purpose, we can use something known as a lock guard, right? So we can use a lock guard for std mutex, right? And we can call this lock guard, say, G and initialize it with my mutex, right? And so basically what this does is it will create this lock guard initialize with my mutex, so it basically locks my mutex. And then when this print function goes out of scope, the destructor for this lock guard will go ahead and free my mutex. That way, no matter what happens, if lock guard goes out of scope and the destructor fires, right, we go ahead and get the expected result where, you know, the mutex will get unlocked. So it's a bit of a safer way. We don't need to worry about this manual unlocking. It's kind of like when we do dynamic allocation, we prefer to do it using something like uh, like a vector, right, or a shared pointer, um, or a unique pointer, right, something that will manage the lifetime of that dynamic allocation rather than manually doing new and free. So with this lock guard, we can go ahead and see if we get the exact same result. If I recompile this and I run the code, right, so it has the exact same result as say locking and unlocking, right, but I don't have to do it manually. I can just put a lock guard in there, and it follows that design pattern of RAII. All right, so that's going to go ahead and do it for this basic example. That's how you can kind of get started with parallel programming, right? So for something as simple as this, right, this is really just an example of, you know, how to get started, right? For something like printing, probably not something that you would want to do uh, maybe in parallel like this. But there may be situations where you are doing printing in parallel. So think about, you know, a, um, a logging tool, right? You may have multiple threads running at the same time, all printing to the same log file, right? So it may not be so much that it's for performance gain, maybe it's for, you know, some kind of functionality, right? That you have to support things like these critical sections where you make sure only one thread is printing at any given moment. But that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. All this code can be found at github.com slash coffee before arch under this repository of parallel programming. So that's gonna go ahead and do it for this video. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.